Good morning, everyone. My name is Marge, and uh, I have with me Blair Hoffman and Joe Ramey. And we are the co-chairs of the Elevator Fundraising Committee. And other committee members include Danny McLennan, Howard Gange, and Pat Weir. Well, we are so pleased to announce that the elevator installation, fire alarm installation, and all related code improvements, including three fully accessible washrooms, have been completed. Everything is now fully functional, and in addition, this facility is now fully compliant, compliant with all the current day building codes. Everything is up to the moment. So we'll savor this moment because we'll know in the future how deficient we might be. There's too many code changes in life. Anyway, it's such good news for all of us. And now's the time uh, that Blair usually provides the fundraising update and the bad news regarding our shortfall in fundraising. So, Blair. Thanks, Marge. Yes, I am usually the bearer of bad news, or better known as the bad news bearer. And usually I uh, come here today to uh, speak to the shortfall, as Marge has said, and to ask you for more money. Well, today I have some good news. We have finally reached our fundraising goal. Of $370,000. And we completed that task in a little over 16 months. So uh, that is just unbelievable. It's a tremendous accomplishment by this congregation, especially given that 15 months ago, we set out to raise $205,000 for an elevator. Now, anybody who knows anything about fundraising, they tell you never to ask for too little money because you'll never get the shortfall. Well, our committee has proven that wrong and this congregation has proven that wrong. I would like to thank the building committee headed by Danny McLennan and his members Don Thorson and Daryl Rowland for their tireless work to bring this work to completion. A special thank you also goes out to our contractor Mark Nagy of Nagy Holdings, Access 2000 who supplied the elevator, Aseal Electric, as well as Prakash Engineering. March. Well, we would like to say a huge thank you to the members of the congregation for all your donations. And sometimes it was two or three donations. And uh, it was all lovely. Like, who would think of a huge fundraising project during a pandemic when the economy's depressed and we're all hiding at home? Anyway, we would also like to thank those individuals who made donations to the project in memory of a loved one. Memorial donations are truly precious, and we appreciate them very, very much. Also, we would be remiss if we did not thank the members of the community at large who also made donations, and uh, we, we appreciate any donations that were made. So on behalf of the fundraising committee, we offer each and every one of you our heartfelt thanks. And we would like to also thank Arthur for all of his assistance with this project. He, yes. He, 
He kept wonderful records and was always able to provide us with the information we needed. And so for all of those extra hours of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, we, we really thank you and appreciate what you've done. Now, in conclusion, we want you all to rise and give yourselves a big round of applause as a standing ovation to yourselves and each other for what you have accomplished. So, congratulations everyone, and we applaud you all. Thank you so much. It has all been very remarkable. We welcome you to worship today, and as we do so, we acknowledge that Calvary United Church stands on Treaty 6 territory. We pay our respects to our elders, both past and present, wherever we find ourselves this morning. We recommit to our status as an affirming ministry within the United Church of Canada and strive to be an open-minded, inclusive, and welcoming place of worship. It is our deepest hope that all people might feel at home in this space, and we give thanks to God for this Sabbath day where we join our hearts and minds in prayer. approach in faith. Creator Christ Spirit, there is none like you in heaven or on earth. We worship you with hearts full of gladness, filled with the affirmation that you shape us and we are yours. Your love endures, your faithfulness extends to all. So it is that we worship the one in three joyously with love. We come, God of justice, God of peace, aware that your world is torn by human strife. We hear the cries of the homeless, the pleas of the hungry, the wails of torment from those who have been displaced. We listen to their cries, 
and we add our own echoes of pain to their voices even as we pray for justice in our world. God of justice, God of peace, help us to bind up the broken ones and to carry the oil of healing to all who are hurting, afraid, bereft. Fill us with the courage to speak out on behalf of those who have no voice. May we share with them our gratitude for your love. A love that offers not only forgiveness, but also hope to all who hunger for peace and for justice. In the light of your love, O God, we pray. Let our light then shine for others, and let us love, not in word alone, but in truth and in deeds, as we echo this familiar prayer. Our Creator Christ Spirit, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now, as we have been richly blessed, so we think of those in our world who need our support and our love. And in thinking of those in the world, we present our offering. The good news reminds us not only that God loves us, but also that God calls us to love one another. We celebrate God's love through our generosity. In the spirit of our Creator's abundance for us, we share our gifts, the fruit of our labors in combination with the hope in our hearts that all might find healing and peace in God's abiding love. Amen. Is 
We continue to follow some of our social distancing protocols, and so we offer to each other this morning the gift of peace in whatever way remains comfortable for us, either by waving our hands or touching our elbows, all while, while maintaining a safe distance. Peace be with you. Reading 2 Kings 2, verses 1 to 2 and 6 to 14. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went on and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept crying and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. He said, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? He struck the water again, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, and Elisha crossed over. Reading from Galatians 5, verses 1 and 13 to 15. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Reading from Luke 9, verses 51 to 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for his arrival, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, 
I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Hear what the scriptures are saying to the church. May the thoughts that I share this day and the ways in which we integrate all of our thoughts within our respective and collective faith journeys be our gift to our Creator Christ Spirit. Amen. Today's readings create for me the full spectrum of emotions from amazement to puzzlement to optimism. Let's begin with amazement. We have the marvelously detailed story of the death of Elijah. Except it isn't really a death, so much as it is a translocation from this earthly realm directly into the heavenly realm, as the people around him would have understood such on that particular day. It is, in fact, the single most intriguing story within the pages of the Hebrew Scriptures, where most stories continue to be, if you pardon the expression, very much down to earth. Now, Elijah has always been portrayed as a larger-than-life prophet. He it is who berates his king and then has to flee the king's not unsurprising wrath to find sanctuary with a widow and her young son in a foreign land when the king expresses his determination to execute him. He it is who encounters God while hiding in a cleft of a rock on a mountainside. Elijah's entire life consists of one dramatic episode after another. So why would his ending not be any less spectacular than all the other moments in his life? If nothing else, the story of Elijah's translation into life after death is colorfully descriptive and therefore also easy to picture. I can see all the lesser prophets gathered there, babbling amongst themselves, wondering what Elijah is going to produce this time. I can see those same prophets jockeying for position, understanding that there probably will be a vacancy for the position of senior prophet in Israel. And I can sense the kind of festive atmosphere that must have surrounded the day except perhaps for one lonely person, the young Elisha, who amongst all of his colleagues probably anticipated most accurately what was about to happen, even if not how it would happen. And so we have the story of Elijah's translation from life into life beyond life, that colorful image of a chariot of fire and Elijah climbing into it and disappearing from the sight of all those protecting themselves from the swirling force of a whirlwind, leaving Elisha to be the new prophet who has to deal with King Ahab and the circle of prophets. We have to pay homage to the script writers of the Oscar-winning movie Chariots of Fire for choosing that colorful title as an image for the story of a group of post-World War I United Kingdom athletes who would triumph at the 1924 Paris Olympic Games, including a Jewish team member who would win the 100-meter dash and a teammate from Scotland who refused to race on the Sabbath but was able to exchange a track event for the middle of the week with another teammate, and who then also won a gold medal. Such inspiring narratives remind us of the beauty and joy of human experiences and serve as a fitting interpretation of Elijah's chariot of fire. From that positive image, we move to a negative one to a village in Samaria that refuses to offer the customary hospitality to Jesus and his disciples. It is a most unusual story, given that everyone in that era understood that traveling for most people consisted of walking to one's destination, and thus rest stops were a necessity, 
as well as an opportunity to exchange news of the wider world with the local inhabitants. We are told that the locals choose to be inhospitable because Jesus and the disciples are making their way to Jerusalem. And all we can think is that there must have been some rivalry between the leaders in Samaria and the leaders in Jerusalem. How might we imagine such a scenario in modern terms? It would be a bit like stopping for lunch in Yorkton and the owner of the restaurant finding out that we were heading to Winnipeg and the owner saying, no, you can't eat here. Obviously, that owner would have had some negative experiences relating to Winnipeg, even though we do not know what those are. If nothing else, the story is a reminder that occasionally we encounter experiences that we do not understand. And while they might be negative, unwelcoming, even involving downright rudeness, how we handle them remains important. We note, for instance, that the disciples want the villagers to be punished. But Jesus says quite firmly, no. This leads me directly into the third reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians, where he admonishes the folk to be servants to one another in love. And yes, you might indeed mark this as a historic moment. I actually like what Paul says here, and I agree wholeheartedly with him. Throughout the biblical narrative from Genesis all the way through to Revelation, one constant theme is that as children of God, we are called to serve one another. Not to judge one another, not to make fun of one another, not to ignore one another but to serve one another. It remains a lesson that we strive to honor here at Calvary through our Care and Share project, through our Mission and Service Fund, through our regular offering that supports the ongoing ministry in this community, through the special fundraising events that not only help maintain a positive financial position, but also help us to be present in the wider community especially in places like the various elder care facilities. Think for a few moments of all the ways in which each member of this congregation serves within the wider community and know that through our faithfulness to that injunction to serve one another, we are truly acting as gospel people and we are making a difference. So it has been. So it is today. So it will continue to be as long as we dwell within the light, love, and direction of our Creator Christ Spirit, to whom we give thanks and praise, now and ever. Amen.
creator Christ's spirit. How fortunate we are indeed to have had so many generations before us who have pondered their faith and developed ways of acknowledging our gratitude to you. We do it through prayer, through Bible study, through music, but also through our daily living as we seek to grow into the faithful people you call us to be. We have learned what our ancestors have taught us, that the light of your countenance was upon them. We marvel at the integrity of their faith and of their faithfulness. In their shadow we seek also your light, that we might be enlightened as we explore what it means to follow you. Grant us grace, especially whenever we meet with discouragement, that we might hold strong to what we believe to be true, that your love, that you love us, and that you give us the strength to endure life's pain as well as the capacity to rejoice in life's delightful moments. As we work at building a present and a future out of the lessons and values of the past, May we continue to study the faith lessons that our foremothers and forefathers taught each successive generation. May we continue to dwell in the light that you have promised us will be a beacon to our faith journey. This we pray in your light as we feel ourselves embraced within your abiding love for us. Amen. And now a blessing. Creator Christ Spirit, we are reassured that you have the strength and the determination to walk along the hills and valleys of our lives. The journey may at times be difficult, and so we tend to take the first step reluctantly. The journey can be hard and also lonely as we carry with us our sadness and our grief. But we dwell in hope and in love. We are filled with eagerness as we greet each new day with sunshine reflecting your light and your love. May the rainbow of your promise to us, O God, be ever before us, around us, and within us. And may you, O God, the holy three in one whom we worship, walk with us as we travel this road called life. And to this all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Amen.
peace whose reign would never end. Mary sang the spirit song within her heart. Flying to the river, she waited circling high. Above the child now grown so full of grace. As he Speak.